So I want to welcome you to uh, Coconomics. The like they they they, hold, they they told us to say something. It was a Norwegian, so it's not the funniest economics festival in the world, but the most fun, I would say. <laughs> and uh, it's I think it's a, a, amazing that these events can get, gather all all people, like people from all, all kind of people coming to listen to a tax debate, which is. But I think that also that we have full house here shows how important this question is. So when I used to start my my PhD. I used to tell people and we worked on taxes and just get like, on so and like, oh, seriously, can we have even a tax return? And this has changed. Like the first change was Panama Papers, right? Because then people like was talking next to the soccer field, watching the kids play and the other parents, oh, taxes. Well, do you, do you work with Panama Papers? Because it was kind of exciting. And, and the journalists did a great job in taking things home and make it relatable to people. And and now we see that in all, like in all political campaigns and before any elections, one of the major issues is taxation and fairness. And what we see here is uh, welfare systems, and we live in a welfare state with a broad welfare state, is under threat. We have a global economy where like, money and people and firms can move across borders. Uh, and, um, but the tax systems and the tax authority is national. And that means that we have a lot of like gazillion different tax rules. And also to complicate things, we also have treaties between countries that also facilitate differences in, those, in, the, in the treatment of the tax rules that already exist. That meaning that there are so many definitions and so many loopholes that people can utilize and, and to uh, escape taxation. That means that it means that somebody who pay less than they should have because they made excessive adaption, either it's evasion or avoidance. Usually we say that avoidance is legal and evasion is illegal, but that's kind of, it's very difficult to, to distinguish. Often it has to in court, but also aggressive, like very active evasion is still like you pay less than a comparable firm or comparable individual. And if somebody pay less than they should, like they're supposed to, then the rest of us have to pay more to cover the bill or we have to reduce the level of services we provide. Is it, is it sound bad for you or is it just echo in my head? It's bad for you as well. So it's, it's a lot of echo. It's not just in my head. Okay, thank you. That's very relief. <laughs> yeah, we're all in the same heads here. That's, that's great. But in order to, oh, thank you. In order to fix that, because there needs a lot of like, there's, there are loopholes. And one of the problems we're seeing that is that it erodes the, justification or, or the legitimacy of taxes when we see that somebody can pay less taxes and then why should I pay my taxes? Why should I, can't I use like illicit labor and don't pay the VAT and stuff and, and save that? So we need to save our tax systems and the legitimacy of the, those to, you know, and close to loopholes that exist. But in order to do that, we need to know the extent of the loopholes and where they are. And how do you find numbers and statistics of something that's like if people want to hide it? Because what we do research, we usually use tax data that's what's reported to tax administration. But we can't, if you can't see it, how can we then estimate the extent or the evolution or whether what we do to fix it actually works? So then we have to use other data. And that's what we have been doing here at, um, we have been in Stavanger for a long time. I'm, I'm head of, oh, my name is Annette Alstazata. <laughs> I'm very enthusiastic about taxes, but I don't, I don't, I have to learn a bit more of marketing. So my name is Annette Alessetta. I'm head of Skattefors Center for Tax Research at NMBU. Yes, it's a agricultural university, life sciences, but we also do a lot of taxes because it's sustainability. And we have this new tax center that's funded by the Ministry of Finance and the, and the Tax Administration through the Research Council. And we also work very strongly together with um, EU Tax Observatory, where Gabriel Zuckerman is at. And we have now together, like EU Texas already have launched now a great new uh, atlas of the offshore world today in Stavanger, which is basically a database. They've put together data like on what is hidden on the offshore. Offshore does not mean what you think here in oil sector, like oil Stavanger, offshore, like the platforms. Offshore means foreign owned or like what's open, what's tried to be hidden because you can't see what's abroad. So we have like really cool new data page or new data on, on offshore financial wealth, on offshore real estate, on profit shifting and on real taxes. And you can go in there and find, find on country level data, you can compare across time. And then we have a tool 
to see the extent and the development of this. And this, but data doesn't work in isolation. So we use these data and now launched a big new tax report that Gabriel was launching in, in Paris on Monday, the Global Tax Evasion Report, which also has where we take the data and basically analyze them. And we had this discussion with the tax administration. And they said, well, you can't just come with problems. You have to show us how to fix it. And there we have something, how to fix the problems. So that was a big motivation. And then I will give the word to our two discussions today. I will give some a br a brief introduction to Gavin Sukman, as head of the EU Tax Observatory. He's the rock star of economics in Europe. And we're super happy to have him here. He has done a lot of research on basically putting the things on the map, like finding out and what a lot of his research has been on, on the, what's hidden on inequality and has made tax administration across the world change the way they work. And he was in the EU at the EU um, conference yesterday. So, this, so what Gabriel and the EU Tax Observatory does is emphasize on research good quality research that really matters and can have an impact on the dissemination. So he has um, written books, has a lot of em emphasis on, on, on impact, and he also won like the prize, like the mo second most prestigious prize in economics. Not the Nobel Prize, but the second one, the Clark Medal, recently. So I'm su we are super proud of you. So very glad to have you here. And also to introduce the next speaker, also as we are, are doing this. Okay. Yeah. Oh, it's falling down. Yeah. Like, you can't. I can't do two, two things at once. So keeping the talking and the sound, but now I can hear it. So the next speaker is Knut Chair. Um, we were um, at um, at the Oil Museum yesterday and had like offshore researchers doing research offshore on offshore oil extraction, learning on that. And then the guide was talking about um, the oil fund. Um, but uh, he didn't know that we had with us the father of the oil fund, Knut Chär, who was the founding CEO. So he has, um, uh, he, he, um, he represents a global investor angle, like because we have the idealistic economics, what we can do, but we also need to talk about what's doable from the investor perspective. And uh, he worked 10 years with building the, the Norges Bank Investment Management, and he's worked in investment committee members and advisor to large investment funds in Asia and Europe, and also currently member of the board of the largest pension fund manager in Europe, APG. And he is also, I'm super happy to have him, uh, like a, a, a professor too at my university, NMBU. So we work together and are working on sustainable finance, bridging finance, taxes, and sustainability. So that's basically what we do at NMBU, working on sustainability from many angles. So I will just now give the word to Gabriel for an introduction on what are we working on in, in taxation. And like we have, uh, we have 10 minutes to give an overview of everything you've been working on the last years. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, uh, and it, it's uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you uh, today. Uh, I, I wanted to start with uh, something that you said that I think is is very important, and I want to to echo and amplify this. Taxes, indeed, is a very important issue. It's probably the most important democratic question and perhaps even one of the most important philosophical question. Why? Because uh, in Norway, in France, in, in uh, many high-income countries, through the tax system, we pull together 50% of all income. In Norway, it's the ratio of taxes to national income is about 50%, which means that half of the, the wealth that's created each year is uh, taxed, is spent, redistributed by the government. And uh, understanding how this works, and more importantly, deciding on how this taxation should uh, occur is probably the most important question we face all as citizens, as, as voters. It's probably the most important democratic question. Um, Taxes also play a very important role in uh, in uh, regulating uh, inequality. 
um, we see it's one of the main lessons of the, the work that's been done on the long run evolution of inequality in many countries. We see that the progressivity of the tax system is probably one, if not the most uh, important uh, determinant of uh, how much income inequality there is. So when tax system is very progressive, you have, you have less inequality, not only less inequality of, of disposable income after tax, but also less inequality of market income before tax, because taxes change not only your take home pay, you know, what you have at the end of the day to, to consume and to save, but they also change your, the incentives to earn income, the incentives to accumulate wealth. And of course, there are tons of policies that, that affect inequality, but uh, the tax system and tax progressivity is probably the, the quantitatively the most important one. So for all those reasons, taxes matter a great deal. And there is a, a problem in the uh, evolution of our tax systems globally since the last 40 years or so. The problem is that um, the, the, the very economic ac actors who have most benefited from globalization, multinational companies, wealthy individuals, have also been those who have seen their taxes fall the most. While at the same time, people who didn't benefit a lot from globalization or sometimes uh, suffered from it, uh, low-income people, uh, uh, retirees, uh, the middle class, have tended to see their taxes increase to make up for the lost revenues, uh, the taxes not paid by multinational companies uh, and, and wealthy individuals. And I think everybody understands that it's, it's not sustainable. It just cannot work. You know, if the people who are doing well, who are doing great because of global economic integration, also at the same time pay less and less in, in taxes, well, this can only uh, uh, end pretty, uh, pretty badly. So that's the issue. And why exactly uh, do multinational companies uh, pay, have tended to pay less in taxes in high income countries? Well, it's because of the, the rise of the tax avoidance opportunities that have uh, been created by globalization. So with globalization, it has become much easier for firms to um, book profits in relatively low tax places. The most striking example is probably the example of, uh, of uh, Google uh, Alphabet, who uh, they, between 2003 and, and 2019, they booked more than $100 billion in profits in Bermuda, where the corporate tax rate is, is, is a relatively modest tax rate of 0%, and where they employ a grand total of three uh, people. And uh, they done that for you know, almost 20 years. Now they, they've stopped doing this. Uh, uh, and and uh, but they've done they've, they've done it for a very long time, and they are not the only ones to do that. You know, there has been this incredible rise in profit shifting by multinational companies in the global tax evasion report that I encourage you all to 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 read uh, uh, from uh, cover to cover. Uh, there is a, a full chapter that's dedicated to this issue where we provide the uh, most uh, recent numbers on the evolution of this phenomenon. And we see that uh, corporate profit shifting by multinational companies reduces global corporate tax revenues by about 10%. It was 0% in the late 1970s, early 1980s. Then this increased to about 10% today. And if you look just at multinational firms themselves, so forget about you know, local businesses, which by definition, they, they don't book profits in Bermuda, they don't have subsidiaries abroad. If you just focus on multinational companies, it's almost 40% of their foreign profits that they book in, uh, in tax havens today. And that has really skyrocketed over the last decade. Um, 
there, ha there has been a number of policy uh, initiatives to try to address that problem. It's been very high on the international uh, agenda. Uh, the OECD in particular has done a lot of work uh, to try to harmonize tax rules across countries, make it more difficult for companies to, uh, to create arrangements like you know, the double Irish or Dutch sandwich or whatever it was called that allowed Google to book so much profit in, in Bermuda, among others. Um, uh, but in spite of all of that, um, the, the profit shifting doesn't uh, show any sign of, uh, of abating. So the phenomenon, the problem is still very much there. Um, in 2021, 140 countries and territories agreed on a global minimum tax of 15%. I'm sure many of you have heard about it because it raised very high hopes at the time. It was the first time that there was an international agreement on uh, how uh, on, on tax rates. We have lots of international agreements about lots of things, about free trade, about you know international capital flows, even about taxation, about how to define profits, which countries has the right to tax what. But uh, until 2021, there was no agreement whatsoever putting a floor to how low tax rates can go. Any rate was okay, 0%. For the first time, there's an agreement that says, no, 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 look, for some profits, the rate shouldn't be less than 15%. So conceptually, it's really a, a, a breakthrough. It's a landmark uh, agreement. It's a, a, a profound evolution in the regulation of globalization. But the sad news, and that's one of the things we explain in the report, is that since 2021, the agreement has been uh, uh, severely watered down. And to such an extent that today it's expected to generate uh, only half or even a third of the revenues that could be hoped uh, from such an agreement in 2020 or 2021. So the bottom line is that there is this big problem of uh, tax avoidance by multinational companies. We've tried things over the last few years. It has not worked very well so far and pretty much everything remains to be done. So for me, it sounds simple, right? It's just stop investing in these bad companies. Uh, is it that simple, Kurt? What is the investor perspective on this? Thank you for inviting me to Coconomics, my first time uh, here. And it gives meaning for me to be in Stavanger, uh, as exemplified by the visit to the museum yesterday. This was the start of the entrepreneurial business for Norway to build the oil sector. Uh, that is a foundation for later uh, the oil firm. And then uh, congratulate uh, Annette uh, and uh, um, so, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, for fantastic work uh, with uh, getting up uh, this uh, report, uh, the database, and it's a beginning, uh, and it's a milestone. Uh, and it's important uh, for investors as well, uh, as I will uh, explain to you. Um, and uh, my idea for you to follow up uh, the next project, the next database, could be uh, like now you are on the country level, um, you could, the next, uh, next generation could be on company level. You could pick the thousand uh, biggest companies worldwide and present uh, on the web uh, their tax status. Where do they pay the tax? Uh, what is the uh, efficient tax rate for each company? Then you can build an awareness on how the corporates uh, contribute to uh, societies. Uh, the angle for uh, investors uh, is, uh, is a financial risk for investors to deal with companies uh, that not take part in uh, uh, sharing the burden of uh, running the societies. And also investors uh, like the oil firm is uh, dependent on a well-functioning market economy with a structure uh, that guarantees the property rights, uh, that guarantees that uh, you have uh, information you can trust, a regulated market and so on. If you don't have a regulated marketplace with property rights and legal uh, system, 
minority shareholders uh, like the fund in Norway and many other investors uh, will be uh, more weak, uh, weakly protected. So it's a, in the interest of uh, investors themselves to uh, safeguard the marketplace for the future. And the threat here is uh, increasing populism. Uh, and we see the trends uh, all over. Uh, and it's quite complicated why we have that. Uh, and that is threatening uh, the framework for market structure and property rights and investors' uh, rights. It's quite complicated, but also not having uh, a tax system functioning, uh, not having uh, the function of uh, uh, adjusting inequality is a part of uh, this. So investors should care because it's a financial risk deal with companies that are not uh, prudent in the way they deport, in the way they uh, operate, that are on the edge of uh, what they are uh, allowed to do. And it's about the system. Uh, investors uh, have uh, for two decades worked with ESG investing, environmental, social governance. And we took part in that uh, when building the oil fund, uh, especially with uh, active ownership, engagement with uh, companies. And we also did work on the UN principles for responsible investing, where we got in those uh, principles. You should be active as a owner, and you should try to impact on uh, the companies where you uh, are uh, an owner. And uh, that has been very successful. Uh, we see examples that uh, ESG, uh, the type of awareness among investors, are moving the capital costs of fossil fuel producers and uh, make it even harder for them to finance new projects with increasing cost of uh, capital. So this ESG work is about uh, environmental sustainability. But I think your work and what we're discussing, discussing here is maybe as important, is about uh, social sustainability, about uh, getting uh, the... Um, it's it said in the foreword by Joseph Stiglitz, uh, it's a quote by uh, American judge uh, Holmes uh, back 100 years ago, taxes uh, is the price we pay for civilized societies. And taking then the investor uh, angle, um, if you don't have this framework protecting uh, your ownership, uh, regulating uh, the marketplace, if you don't have the availability of educated workforce and the trust in the system, uh, you are uh, not that good uh, protected. And the populism, uh, if you take that uh, uh, some years uh, forward, it uh, goes into chronic capitalism. And that is a system with business and politicians uh, together. And minority shareholders uh, may be squeezed. And then we can take that into the next level that is uh, even more depressing. So I think we all should care about this. And I think we can come back to later uh, what uh, investors uh, actually can do. Thank you, Knut. I'm so glad to have you both here in the chair because usually I've like over many years ago and do many panel debates and discussions and events and basically only preaching to the choir. So those who like I've been presenting your book many times, Gabriel, because you can't come to Norway, so they ask me. But whenever I like, ask, okay, but it's not interesting to go to an event and present stuff when, where everybody agree. Uh, so we need to, to discuss the, this issue across different uh, perspectives and different groups to see how we can solve it. So. So uh, we are talking about all the depressing stuff, Gabriel, uh, that all this, how, how horrible the world looks. So where do we go from now to change it, do you think? Like, how do we make the, the profit shifting less? And what's the first steps? The, the first step is uh, to dramatically increase uh, transparency. So 
you said next report i want to see uh the taxes paid by uh, companies on a country by country uh, basis and for each firm individually and my answer is yes we want to do that but we can't do that we can't do that because there is no public country by country reporting of uh, firm profits and firm uh, activity more broadly, which when you think about it is really completely crazy. There's no mandatory reporting even for publicly listed companies, even for the largest publicly listed companies on the planet, probably the most powerful economic actors, you know, companies that employ hundreds of thousands of people that make tens of billions of profits. We are not even asking those companies today to please tell us where do you pay your taxes? Where do you book your profits? There are, there are some requirements for specific sectors of the economy, like for the banking sector in the European Union, for some companies in, in the uh, uh, oil and gas extraction sector, But the general rule, if you take you know, a company uh, outside of those sectors, is that there's just no information. They are not asked to uh, provide this very minimal, basic piece of information. And to me, the first thing that investors should do is they should say, you have to tell us. Because look, you are the owners, You want the information. So ask them. I, I ask them politely, but they tell me <laughs> we couldn't care less. You are the owner. You own the shares. So you ask them. You have to publish that information now. So the good news, Gabriel, is that the investors are doing that. Uh, and I knew when I was framing this uh, proposal to you. So uh, For example, uh, in BIM, they have an expectation to companies they invest in on tax and transparency. So we find on the website of NBIM that uh, document. So it's a policy. And then they, they require you to all the 9,000 companies where they are invested to give information on at each uh, country you operate what is the value added in that country and what do you pay by tax in tax so they require that information and they see that uh, as i understand that uh, more and more companies are giving more open information because investors ask investor understands uh, that it's a risk uh, for them so Uh, there are other investors as well. Uh, NBIM is maybe among the most uh, advanced. And they engage in dialogues with companies on these issues because of the financial risk. Uh, and they see that uh, in some cases, uh, companies are not listening. Uh, and they can build an impression that uh, it's something with their management here. Uh, they don't take this serious. It may be a management that are not up to speed, or if it's not going to uh, be any changes there, uh, we uh, decide to divest. And you see in the last uh, sustainability report from NBIM that they have divested from uh, around 80 companies because they haven't given an assurance uh, about their uh, handling of uh, tax. Uh, not giving uh, the information required. So uh, my advice uh, here is uh, build on the momentum uh, here uh, and um, create some more awareness among uh, uh, investors uh, based on the reasons you are giving. Uh, and as you say, uh, investors can put that pressure on, uh, on companies. And by the way, uh, ESG is uh, extremely powerful because also consumers uh, are acting. And we saw that with uh, the aggressive Russian attack on Ukraine, uh, that started a movement among consumers and also employees in companies. 
and after some months, more than thousand Western companies uh, had uh, the top management had decided to withdraw from Russia because of the pressure from uh, consumers, uh, employees, and investors. So creating more general uh, awareness, uh, demanding this transparency, uh, will also, I think, uh, create uh, the same time of uh, actions uh, among uh, companies. So money talks. So you don't have enough money, Gable. That's why they don't respond to you when you ask about this information. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's great with this that the, the oil fund is... is saying they're responsible on taxes. Uh, we don't know because we can't see what they're doing, right? They say that they get information and they follow up. Problem is that that information should be publicly available so that all of us could check that. It should be transparent. So it's not like we are asked. So it's, it's a good thing to see that, okay, there's some great news. If the ones with the money ask, they actually had, have effect and they get information they get. Like I was in the complaint board for the petroleum taxation and then was even asking to to get confirmation from companies on like wh why do you have these in prices when you like sell internally and we'll because there's there's this was suspicious like getting that information is super difficult they don't answer the tax authorities but of course they answer the investors right so so the investors should pressure to make this more public information so that everybody can use that and actually everybody can see if this is is done and also whether the investors actually follow the this claims that they should is my okay i'm going to be a moderator i'm going to ask questions do you think this what do you think should be done gabriel yeah i think i think you're perfectly right uh and it uh, i think uh it's great that they give you information to you and privately confidentially that's fantastic but that's not really enough. What we want is information to the public, for the public, because these companies, you know, big listed companies, uh, they matter, they are uh, above and beyond just the private interests of shareholders. They have a lot of influence on the way the world works. And so uh, the, the rest of the world also, also needs to know about how much tax they pay and where they book their profits. So I'm glad to hear that they give you information, but really that's not my request. My request is you should ask them to publish, for the public to publish the information. So that's number one. Number two, and I think Annette wants some, some, some not disagreement, but maybe let's uh, have uh, more, uh, uh, let, 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 let me let me put it that way. Uh, transparency is is good. I think we we all agree with that. It's uh, it's it's a prerequisite, but it's not enough, right? Because even if we have data, even if we had public data and showing that some companies pay uh, you know ten percent, fifteen percent in taxes and shift profits to tax havens. What do we do with that? What we need to make real progress is to have binding minimum taxes, okay? And so, for instance, in the report, we say very clearly that there should be a norm where multinational companies are not allowed to pay less than uh, uh, mom and pop uh, businesses and small businesses, domestic companies. The statutory corporate tax rate in many countries is around, what, in the range of 20 to 30%. So there should be a minimum tax of at least 25% for multinational companies on a country by country basis. So my question is this, if you see a company that you know, has an effective tax rate, that's significantly lower than that. Let's say 15%, 13, 17, 18. What do you do? For me, I say it's not acceptable, it's not sustainable. If the most powerful economic actors are allowed to pay uh, less year after year than, than the rest, it's corrosive 
for uh, inequality. It's even corrosive from a pure economic efficiency perspective because it, it, it it's going to lead to more concentration of economic activity uh, in, in just a few companies. So it's going to reinforce market concentration, market power. So it doesn't seem really desirable, neither from an efficiency nor from an equity perspective. So do you divest? is my question for you. If you see tax rates that are too low, do you divest and, and when? Because uh, uh, it's very important to be precise about the numbers. Is is 15% okay? Is 10% okay? Is 5% okay? When do you say it's not okay, you know, that you pay so much less than, uh, than the rest of the population? So let me just emphasize, um Knut is not, he's not in the oil fund. He's representing uh, investors, like investor view. And, and my, my take on the, what they say that he, like when they get information, that I think it's a hopeful that the information exists and it's not Knut's fault that this is not shared. Let's just emphasize that. Well, yeah, what, what I think. Yeah, so let's emphasize that. We're all like, yes. we don't blame it on you, Knut. And yeah. I think it's great to show that, but I, I think it's a super important point to show that they give the information, the companies give the information when the right people ask, right? So now you can answer the question. We're all friends here. Uh, uh, so, yeah, it's obviously a long time since I uh, left. I have no responsibility, but. Uh, Sometimes I incline to uh, defend my uh, colleague, uh, all the colleagues. Uh, and when you are saying that uh, we, we cannot know what they are doing, it's wrong. You can read the sustainability report from NBIM, and they write about uh, how they operate, also the tax expectation document. And then you can read the document on the web. Uh, it's quite much information already available. Uh, and I think they are leading uh, the pack uh, globally in being that uh, transparent. So uh, the policy that they follow uh, is uh, uh, give all the information. Uh, as I said, on uh, uh, in what country you uh, create what value uh, and what you pay your tax. And they want that to be disclosed by the companies. And that will over time be a part of the reporting by companies. Uh, and I am also require the boards uh, to have a tax policy that is owned by the board. This is not for the division at the uh, offshore uh, entity or uh, some uh, lawyers. It's a board responsibility how they deal with these issues. Uh, that's, I think, important uh, in the policy by NBIM. Uh, and to your question, uh, Gabriel, what is the right level? What is missing in uh, the NBIM expectation document uh, is uh, the requirement on minimum tax. Uh, and if I were to uh, advise on this, uh, it is that the next generation of expectations, and I know that other investors are doing this, uh, they should put in expectations on minimum tax rate. Uh, and I think the work, uh, when you get 240 countries to agree in 2021, I think two years before that, uh, we wouldn't expect that to happen. It's a milestone. And, and you can ask for uh, from 15 to 25, and it's all the loopholes and all that, but it's a beginning. And it's already a type of benchmark uh, where investors can say, if you pay less, if you not comply, explain and do it publicly. So it creates a momentum here. Uh, so I, I think investors, uh, they care of ob obvious reasons because it's a financial risk and it's a, the whole uh, ownership structure framework in organized societies is at risk. And I, I worry a lot about that because I'm also thinking about the Norwegian investments 10, 20, 30 years ahead. In what type of societies uh, how can minority shareholders be protected in uh, the future? So this is uh, an important part of that. Uh, we have a negative trend uh, with um, more autocratic uh, governance, countries uh, taking, uh, um, getting uh, bigger, more countries going into that league. Uh, less countries are free countries. Uh, 
uh, under traditional protection of investor right type of countries are on uh, a negative uh, trend with regard to population and number of uh, countries. And I think investors should care about that. So what you're saying, part of the solution is because we want to make investors responsible because the money talks, uh, is moving the tax question, the tax responsibility from the soft documents into the risk assessment evaluations of the investors. Is that the part of the solution? You know, um, you, you can look at ESG from two angles. Uh, you can look at it from uh, just do good and uh, try to be a politician. My angle into this uh, all the way is about uh, risk, uh, financial risk. When you are a, a long-term investor, like a national fund, uh, and you invest for future generations, uh, a management that is uh, hiding data or uh, going against uh, national regulation because of short-term profit is a long-term liability. And when you are in this game for the long run, uh, that becomes a liability for you. And when you own the whole market, because you are boldly diversified, you take a responsibility for uh, the market also. So we have to... Uh, uh, have a wide perspective into this uh, because uh, risk it ends up at a risk for you uh, over the longer uh, longer haul. Um, history is about extra financial risk that will come up uh, to you later. And, and one of the I, I, I can give uh, if you have time one example. Uh, my work uh, now uh, and has been uh, many years ago when I was chairman at CSRO, the Climate Research Institute, uh, the climate risk uh, and uh, financial risk of uh, global warming. Uh, what is that for investors? Uh, quite recently, um, GIC of Singapore is a mega big fund uh, owned by the Singapore state. I've been a member of the investment committee for years, not now. Uh, they published a report uh, some months ago uh, saying that uh, the financial climate risk for that fund uh, in a scenario with uh, failed transition over 40 years, the value of the fund will decrease by 30 percent, three zero, compared to a net zero scenario. So it is an example of investors internalize what is a kind of political question into what could be a financial severe issue for themselves. And by doing that, uh, you also understand that you are a part of uh, finding uh, solutions. It should affect the way you invest. Uh, and I think uh, I haven't seen calculations on social uh, stability and uh, the price uh, needed to uh, be paid for a civilized society and all, all that. But I think it's the same type of thing, uh, that it comes back, back to you uh, as a big risk in the future. So did we just hear Economics uh, Stavanger 2023 solve this profit shifting problem? Making a, like, a, like a pragmatic 15%, even if you think it's too low, saying that investors, like big investors, national investors, aren't, shouldn't uh, invest in companies that pay lower than 15% tax, the, this OECD, and get it into the risk. Is problem solved? What do you say, Gabriel? <laughs> what I would say is this. Um, according to the, to the best estimates that, that we have, uh, developing countries need about $500 billion in additional tax revenue each year to fight uh, climate change, to address the challenges of climate change. There is a need for half a trillion dollars of extra government revenue for developing countries. What, one thing we show in the report is you can collect about half a trillion dollars, $500 billion in additional tax revenue with just a strengthened minimum tax on multinational companies with a 25% tax rate and no loopholes. So my question is, is this uh, something 
uh, that uh, as investors, we, we can agree that, uh, that this should be the goal, meaning there should be a transition towards divestment from companies that pay less than 25% effective tax rate on a country by country basis. Because I share all, everything you said about risk management, the importance and ES, of ESG and everything. But I, I guess the general skepticism that many people have about all of this is practically, concretely, in terms of quantitative objectives, how are you going to translate that into uh, action that are going to actually make the world a better place. And what, I, what we show in the report is that if we force a 25% minimum tax with no loophole for multinational companies, we can generate the revenues needed for uh, the fight against climate change in developing countries. So I think it's a clear objective. We know how to get there. Is it something that uh, uh, investors can facilitate? Uh, the social problem of uh, having a fair tax system uh, and the problem of uh, harmonizing between countries with conflicting objectives that's mainly a political questions for national and international institutions and uh, not a question for investors. That's a basic here. Uh, and I think your report and your work is addressing that. Uh, it has a national uh, policy dimension and it has uh, like G20 OECD behind uh, the minimum uh, tax. Uh, and uh, you also said uh, in the lecture before this that uh, also smaller countries can move ahead. You don't have to wait for the pack and the pack will never agree. Uh, so I don't uh, want to hear even I'm pre presenting investors uh, take a kind of responsibility for investors will take that, uh, you know, and you increase from 15 to 25 percent and what will be the next. Um, but it's a beginning here. Uh, if we start to say that uh, it's a benchmark, we begin with the 15% that has been agreed. And you comply or you explain. And as investor, uh, you recommend uh, that each company report publicly about uh, how much value they create in each uh, country. That's a very good uh, beginning. I I think I, I really fully agree with you, but I think I draw s somewhat different conclusions. I agree fundamentally with the view that this question of what tax rates should be, what minimum tax rates should be, it's not for investors to decide. It's a policy question. It's a political question for, for, for citizens to decide through democratic deliberation, through the vote. I totally agree with this, and I think this is how change will come. But the conclusion I draw from that is that it's not through ESG that change will come. That, you know, on that front, it's not likely that it's going to make uh, any significant difference. That if we make, if we want to make a difference to, uh, uh, you know, the, the fairness of the tax system, to the dynamic of inequality. Uh, if we want to fix the issue of profit shifting, you know, it's all policy. These are all policy choices. And what I, what I draw from your remarks is that, you know, ESG is pointless. No. <laughs> uh, sorry for uh, not uh, making my statements uh, clear. That was my interpretation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, uh, I, I think... Uh, it works uh, together here. Uh, investors frame expectations. And I think the document from NBIM is an extremely good example. And you could add the 15% expectation to that. And you continue working uh, with the next generation atlas. 
uh, that includes uh, information on companies. Start with the thousand biggest companies. And investors help you with companies uh, delivering that information because investors understand that it's a financial risk to deal with companies that are seen as uh, not a uh, good part of the societies. Uh, and I think we see quite often uh, when doing investments uh, that the biggest risk uh, for investors is uh, bad management. A management that don't understand that uh, it's not about them. Uh, it's about uh, long-term value creation for also minority shareholders. And it's a correlation between uh, bad management of that type and companies breaking with rules. So investors really have incentive to uh, act when they see companies that are operating on the edge of uh, what are norms and, uh, and uh, regulations. So you agree on the need for more information transparency and also tax responsibility and also making this accountable, right? Because not saying wishy-washy should pay their taxes, but basically have an expectation. And that basically the, the consequence, like the, the magic word here is the S word. I once was at the OECD and talked about something and they said, <gasps> Don't say the S word, that will clear the room. And the S word was sanctions. That things have consequences. Like it's not wishy-washy talk. Like, okay, so if you don't pay your taxes, we don't invest in you. That's the consequence. You're talking about 15% at least. Then it's, it's uh, we can discuss the rates. They should be higher, but it's kind of good to to anchor that maybe in something that's already agreed on. And to say, as you say, there's a political process and democratic process. And basically, it's you who decide, right? The voters decide, and you. It's your job to make the pressure, and there's a develop uh, democratic process. So, like, you can't vote now. But I, are there are there any questions you want to raise now when we have these amazing two people here to ask? Yes, one uh, behind the banner, yeah. Can you comment on the OECD framework on the Pillar 2, which please? will be effective from 2024, securing minimum 50% tax? So I'll repeat, could you please comment on the Pillar 2 framework OECD, like with the minimum tax of 15%? Yes, that's a very important question. The, uh, there, there was... Uh, high hopes in 2021 when countries agreed on this 15% minimum tax, even though the rate was was low, there was the promise that at least it would be implemented systematically. And 15% is more than zero, so you know there was the hope that there would be progress. But since 2021, the uh, uh, the agreement has been uh, uh, very dramatically weakened by a series of exemptions and loopholes. Um, perhaps let me just uh, mention two. One is that uh, is just a, a very basic question of what counts as a tax. And in the new version, in the latest version of the agreement, if uh, uh, firms receive uh, tax credits, so they get reimbursed for taxes that they have paid, you know, there are tax credits for research and development, for all sorts of things. If they receive tax credits, then these tax credits are not counted as a reduction in taxes paid. So that even a company, let's say, a company that pays, that makes 100 in profits, pays 20 in tax, and then gets a tax credit of 15, so the true tax rate of that company is five. It has paid five out of 100 in profit. From the perspective of the Pillar 2 agreement, the, the tax rate of that company will be 20. 20 is more than 15, and so it, will, it, it won't have any extra tax to pay. So 
there is this. So what's going to happen most likely is that countries, instead of competing by offering low statutory tax rates, as they used to do since the 1980s, they are going to compete by offering tax credits. And we already see places like Bermuda that say, oh, look, we are going to introduce a corporate tax rate. 0% maybe was a bit too low, but we are going to introduce a rate of 8%. But don't worry, don't worry, investors, please don't worry, because we will give you tax credits uh, for whatever can be creative. And it will more or less offset the 8% tax. And uh, will this be uh, ESG compliant? I don't know, but at least it will be pillar two compliant, meaning even if a company pays zero tax net of tax credits, uh, it uh, in, in many cases uh, uh, will be enough uh, to avoid the minimum tax of 15%. So. Uh, that's uh, that's a big that's a big uh, red flag. The other big issue, which is even in fact bigger uh, conceptually, is that in in this uh, in this agreement on the 15% global minimum tax, there is an exemption for profits that correspond to uh, real activity in tax havens. What this means is that if a company uh, uh, has uh, production uh, in a low-tax country, it can exclude the profits that correspond to that uh, real production from the base of the minimum tax. So concretely, it means the, for a firm, the more activity you move to a tax haven, the more production, the more um, jobs, the more factories you move to a tax haven, then the lower your tax will be, the more you will be able to go below 15%, and there won't be any floor. You will be able to go to 10%, 5%, 0%. Again, will this be ESG compliant? I don't know, but it's killing the agreement. We have questions, but it's... Uh, okay, Mimir, uh, you, are, you get... I was told to kill it, but like... You, <laughs> one more question. Yeah, I'll just uh, ignore it. the debate about the tax planning tax evasion the last year has not been about corporations, but about high net worth individuals moving to Switzerland. And uh, the question, I have two questions about it. One, do you think this is a Norway problem or a Switzerland problem? <laughs> the second question is, is, how is it compared to the discussion about corporate tax evasion? Is, is the individual taxation a smaller problem or not a big, is it a trifle or is it a big problem in itself that people have the corporation staying in Norway but their personal taxes will be Okay, this is too long a question to repeat for everybody yeah. online, but I, you heard it and we will also, that's a completely new discussion on that in two hours. So I'll, I'll be brief. It's a big problem, just like companies. And I'm, I, I think I'm going to surprise you, but it's a, it's a Norway problem. It's not a Switzerland problem. It's a Norway problem because, not because uh, Norway has high tax rates, but because there is a choice that's made to let people move to tax havens and then say, once they've moved, we stop taxing them. But of course, there are other choices that can be made. Norway could say, oh, well, guess what? You've become a very rich in Norway. You've lived there for, for 60 years. And now you choose to move to Switzerland. That's your right, of course. Switzerland, that's their right. They can choose whatever they want. Their tax rate, zero, whatever. But we, Norway, we are going to keep taxing you uh, after you've left. Perhaps not until you die, but maybe for five, 10, 15 years. And the logic is obvious and very strong which is that if you've become very rich in Norway, that's in part because you've benefited from uh, public infrastructure, from access to the market, from education, from healthcare. And so there's just no natural right to move to a tax haven and have nothing, no tax to pay uh, anymore. You know, all wealth creation is partly, sometimes largely, a social creation. And you can't just you know, disappear after having become a billionaire from society and have no tax to pay anymore. Okay, 
that was a very popular uh, topic, and uh, it's also a topic that's much more easier to fix than the profit shifting of multinationals and what investors should do, like an immediate term, because now we can just kill the tax agreement with Switzerland. Um, but this is the discussion that we'll have in two hours on a new panel. So stay tuned, and, and then you can uh, save your questions for then. And I will thank both Knut and Gabriel for being here and helping us through these very difficult questions. And have fun. <laughs>